Calm technology is a way of allowing yourself to pay attention to information without overburdening your attention. The problem is that we have lots and lots of information in the world and there's so much with so many devices and so many different systems that people can get really stressed out. They don't know which information to pay attention to and why and where. And a calm technology allows you to take that information that would normally distract you and push it into different senses. So instead of just having something straight in front of you that's a perfect display with lots and lots of information, you could just reduce that to a tone or a simple light. And then when you choose, you can get a higher resolution of information. This idea of primary information in front of you that's very high resolution and secondary and tertiary allows you to compress that information in a way that you can pay attention. So for instance, I had an employee that got an insulin pump and he was really excited because he'd become more of a cyborg. The problem was that the insulin pump beeped. And so everybody thought he was being really rude and disruptive when he was at weddings or funerals or movie theaters. And then when he was at concerts that were really loud, he couldn't hear the insulin pump beep and he wasn't allowed to change the notification. So sometimes allowing somebody to change the notification for a context is really, really important. And he wasn't able to change it. In this case, a haptic buzz on his skin would have made more sense. It's more about making technology a part of people's life instead of interrupting their lives. And that's a really hard thing to do. The technology that's a part of your life, that's beautiful, that's functional, that's by your side, becomes this kind of non-human companion. And that leads to beloved brands and a lot of sales and companies. It's, it's really profitable. It just takes a lot longer to design because you have to really know how to make something that fits into somebody's life. A lot of these systems are still designed as if we're living in a world of the desktop, whereas we're living in a world of ubiquitous computing in which computing can be everywhere. It's in our pockets, it's in our homes, it's in our cars. And so we don't know when we build this technology what situation it will be in. And so it's our responsibility to design systems that work well when they fail or work well under less than perfect circumstances. When an escalator breaks, it turns into stairs. When our computers break, they just break entirely. If you put your phone onto airplane mode, it's really hard to actually use a lot of the things on the phone. How do we marry the physical and the digital world and show the, the digital information above the physical? How do we bring that back into the analog world so that we can be better informed. So there's these differences when you try to think about what's the least amount of technology that we can use to get the job done. And that's one of the other principles of calm technology. How do you take things away until there's nothing left to take away? You get at the core because every single new feature you implement has its own support cycle and build cycle and failure cycle and um, end of life cycle. It's, it's super complex and it's not necessary most of the time. It's not that technology isn't ready for humans. Humans are not generally ready for technology. It has to have some metabolization. It has to have some digestive period where we get used to it and push it into our social norms. And so the idea that we're cyborgs is that we can choose our destiny if we want. Uh, even if we have an AI outside of ourselves, like publicly traded companies that have to grow and show us, and show us what we need to do, uh, we still have the ability to choose. And I think it's really important to remember that we need to calm down our technology and our alerts and notifications and handle our data and ask ourselves, what are we optimizing for? What are we actually trying to do? And if the promise of technology was to free our, our time up, what happened to our time when technology and social media is like a gas that fills every available space in our lives? How do we get more reflective time, more what the Greeks called kairos time instead of the industrial chronos time where everything is scheduled? How do we have more time for the imagination and do what humans are good at and leave what machines are good at to machines. Optimize the two so that we have more of a symbiosis instead of being worried about all of the machines taking our jobs.